people made in the image of God with value and worth. Uh, and we have a combined purpose to rule and subdue. And there's a whole bunch we could talk on that, but we're not going to right now. But there's some pretty powerful words to rule and subdue. It isn't this whole idea of uh, to rule and subdue is to honor and bring forth, to bring forth their true identity. So often kids, adult kids, lose their sense of self. And when I hear the word rule and subdue, it's like a third grade class teacher who's ushering the kids down the hallway in elementary school, and she's ushering them out to the playground. She's ruling and subduing, not in such a way that they're, that they're being squished or, or made to feel less than. She's ruling and subduing them so that they could experience their best life. So that's the Hebrew behind rule and subdue. It's just bringing out the true sense of, of self. And that's a big deal. So what is family? I mean, there's a lot that goes into what is family. And of course, family is a parenting team. Uh, now, the parenting team could be grafted people. Like there's my, my dad is, is really checked out, but the church has provided dads for me. My wife's family is pretty checked out because of drugs and alcohol, but the, the church has provided family for her. The God, God has provided everything we need in the family of God. But it's this parenting team. And, and I need two volunteers. Just, just uh, do you two mind coming forward? The guy with the hat and the lady next to you? I'm assuming that's someone you know. Could you two come forward? <laughs> It's, I promise you, it's just you. I know, you're like, why did I make eye contact with that loser? Just come, come, come forward. Just, it's not going to hurt, I promise. I mean, unless you don't follow my instructions, then it will hurt. But uh, so what I, what I uh, uh, what's your name? Heather. Hell, that's a, okay. I know, Heather. What about you? Steve, Steve I was going to call you Josh. All right, so Heather, you stand here, and you face this one, and you stand right about there, and you face that one. Now, I want your arms out. You too, both of you. Now, back up a little bit. Now, I want you to fall into each other, and you got to catch her. Or you're going to be... It's, no, i got to fall forward. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, all right. So, I know, this is not going to be good, but it's all right. That's, I'm a visiting guy. Just play my game. So, yep, go for it. Lean forward into each other. So, this, this is the picture of a parenting team. And, and in the Bible, just keep on doing that for a second. I'm just going to... i gotta, I got to find my place in the Bible. So, the Bible said, for this reason... Uh, right here. I'm just got to find my... Okay, right here. The Lord said, uh, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make... For him, a suitable helper. And people get confused by this suitable helper. We think the suitable helper, is like a helper, you think like some just loser who's just on the bottom rung of the totem pole and you, you sweep up the floor. No, helper is always used to describe God. 21 times in the Old Testament, helper uh, is mentioned. 17 of those times it's mentioned to describe God. God is our helper. Is it, there's a divine. So helper, suitable, means corresponding to. So like if Josh, right, Steve, Paul? Frank. Okay, so if he, if he moved, she'd fall on her face. If she moved, he'd fall. They're suitable. They're corresponding to you. You can stop now. Thank you for playing. Uh, I'd give you a lollipop, but I can't find him right now. So the uh, suitable helper, it's like a bird flies with, this is rocket science now, two wings and not one. Uh, a bird can't fly with one wing. Uh, a suitable helper, when, when God said, I will make man a suitable helper, it had nothing to do with with less than. It had all to do with corresponding to. It's a powerful study. Go online and type in Hebrew words for suitable helper. You'll be blown away by what you'll read and describe. So what is family? It's a group of people made in the image of God with purpose and value and worth and the parenting team, which could include all kinds of other people, not just the biological parents, that are corresponding to. They support each other. They're required or they fall flat on their face. Another thing that uh, a family is, is it's an emotional system. And this is the last thing we're going to talk about this before we move on. It's an emotional system. Uh, I was a systems engineer designing cell phones. Uh, then I went to school to be a preacher at Johnson Bible College. And then I went to Arizona State University to be a sociologist. So I've got these, these warring thoughts, but they all flow through the system architecture. I like to look at stuff from the top down. And so an emotional system. These squiggly lines represent people in your system. Some are a little confusing. Some are way too happy, right? <laughs> it's, it's like, would you just 
stop being so happy. Some are really, uh, are really pointed, right? So they're just like, eh, you get too close, you get stuck. They're a little pointed. Uh, some are misshaped uh, for whatever reason. Sometimes it's the atrocities of life that mis- misshape us, and, he's, uh, and there's overlapping. And so each person in your family system is represented by a shape. And, and, and so it's an emotional system, and these shapes communicate with each other. These, like, these big shapes, like the parents and grandparents, they communicate over their fears, their joys, their sorrows, their hopes. We communicate into the lives of our children, really, with social cues. It starts in the second trimester. So it's amazing. Uh, the, the, the studies they have, re, re, re seen, have researched and seen, but there's these communication pathways between all these shapes. Everybody's talking to everybody. It's a confusing, emotional mess. <laughs> There's a lot of opportunity to manage conflict in a family system because everybody's talking to somebody, and somebody else is talking to this person, this person's talking to that person, that person's talking to that person, and this one's over here is texting them, and they're face. There's a lot. This is an emotional system, and we form these relational triangles. That's why the triangle's so big in there. Somewhere in the middle of that big mess is a, is a relational triangle. It could be mom, dad, and child. It could be mom and dad on one point of the triangle, child on another, and the teacher at school, or the football coach, or the kid down the street, or the in-laws, or the outlaws, or, or people in the family system. And we have these relational triangles, and part of the challenge and development is to manage the emotional triangles. We're always in relational triangles. How are we participating in them is is really the challenge. Like my wife and I, we have four kids. The youngest one, he would come to me before, before dinner years ago, and he would say, Dad, I want ice cream. I mean, he'd go to his mom and say, Mom, I want some ice cream right before dinner. And she'd be like, you're not getting ice cream before dinner. I'm making dinner right now. Go sit down. And then he'd come to me, and he'd say, Dad, I want some ice cream. I'm like, well, as long as you bring me some. I mean, that was my, that was my answer. He was managing the relational triangle. He went to mom first, that didn't work, went to dad second, and we were in a triangle together. Uh, Our oldest son, he wanted a car when he was 16, and I was like, okay, he came to me and said, I want a car. I was like, great, let's get a job. I'm going to teach you how to budget, save money to buy a car, we'll help you, but we're going to go through this together. And he didn't like that idea, so he went to his grandmother, who felt bad for him because he had been in some mess, and and she's like, okay, I'll just buy you a car. And and he comes, she comes home with a car. Like a piece of junk, $1,200 car, but she came home with a car, and I was really upset. The relational triangle can be funny, it could be developing, developing, or it can get in the way. So what is a family? There's a lot of answers to what a family is. It's, it's an array, it's a system, it's a movement, and ultimately in God's world, it's a body of Christ. You hear the body of Christ metaphor used to describe the church. You know, the nose is as important as the toe, which is as important as the elbow, and everybody's got their place in the body. If the body was a bunch of noses, we'd get nothing done. If it was a bunch of toes, we'd get nothing done. Same with the family. Every single person in my family and your family is unique, uh, but they fit. And how they fit is development. Uh, We don't start off fitting, we end by fitting. So that's kind of the, the goal with this idea is what is family. And, and you'll see the scripture here. You are the body of Christ. If each one of you is a part of it, if one part suffers, every part suffers. And so that's the goal is to see how we all fit together. And we're very unique like this sand, right? This sand represents different people in a family. Sitting in a container, it will never blend. But if you put it in an hourglass, it will blend over time. And so when I do weddings for people, officiate weddings, I just did my daughter last weekend, I bought her an hourglass, one of those unity sand hourglasses. And we poured the Christ, the red sand in first, the moms pulled it, poured in the family sand, and then they poured in the sand that represents them, and then it went through the hourglass and it began to blend. And then over time, I tell them to flip it over and keep on blending and keep on blending. But if it's standing still and static, It'll never blend. It might look good from a distance, but it's never blended. So the challenge in this whole thing is to develop, is to blend, is to find out where we fit to maintain our uniqueness while seeing how we fit. So any, any snide comments or 
rude accusations yet? Okay. If you, answer, if you ask a question, I'll, I'll give you candy. All right, so the role, of course, now we know what a family is. Each family's got a role, and it's a big deal. This is a big deal to experience life, first and foremost. That's what we do. We experience life together. But the big thing is we define normal. That's crazy. I was raised in a very, very, very abusive home uh, in the inner city, uh, and it was row homes. So you see those row homes on TV. It's like 12 feet wide, 40 feet long, and they share the roof. They share walls. There's 10 houses on one side of the block and 10 houses on the other. I got secondhand smoke from the guy three houses up. I mean, they're all, they're all combined. One roof, one porch, different sets of rod iron. So that's row homes. Uh, and, and I lived at 532 North St. Elmo Street. The way we lived at 530 North St. Elmo Street was freakishly different than 530 North St. Elmo Street. Uh, I thought everybody lived the way our family lived. Turns out they weren't. And I didn't know that until I was in my teenage years. I'd go to my friend's house. I'm like, wow, so you're not, so your dad isn't drinking a fifth a day. He's not throwing chairs across the room. They're like, no, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, I thought everybody's dad did that. How, how do we know the difference between each home? So we, you, set quote unquote normal. That's a huge challenge. And, and, and we define with that gender roles, as you could read, morals, faith. Uh, we define everything. We, we model social interaction, uh, whether you're standing uh, shoulder to shoulder talking to somebody or you're talking to them with your side uh, or, or you're not looking at them in the eye. All that stuff's modeled by the, the family system. So all of this stuff is meant to just remind us and kind of reset the system. And, 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 of course, we help create the life narrative. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty big deal, the life narrative. And a lot of it is created from what we've gone through. You, you ever hear of the term helicopter mom? It's a term that describes a mother who hovers around her child uh, because she's afraid the child's going to do what she did. Maybe uh, I know a mom, she got pregnant at 16. Every time her daughter was 10 minutes late, well, obviously she's getting pregnant right now. I mean, she just assumed, uh, and she would hover. I've also met, uh, we call them lawnmower dads. And what they do is they go in front of their child and mow down all the problems. I don't want my kid to experience any problems. They're the ones that are in the face of the coach. Uh, they're the ones who, who, uh, who don't want to score for Little League. <laughs> I think we should be a winner and a loser because you need to learn how to win and you need to learn how to lose. Uh, and so uh, lawnmower dads, they mow down the problems. All these things set up that life narrative. Thankfully, we're, we're like Plato. We get to, we change. Uh, like the Apostle Paul said, we, we change. So, so some of the things we may think, well, oh, gosh, maybe I was a lawnmower dad. Well, that's fine. We just realize it, move forward, and we grow through it. So there's no right or wrong. There's no, ah, I shouldn't have done that. It's just, okay, new information, new experiences, let's move forward. And so, but it's a big deal for us to think through uh, the roles of a family. It, it informs how we manage conflict, and it informs how we develop our families intentionally. And, and uh, there's a lot of ways to look at the, the, the role. Uh, you could look at a lot of different ideas online. Like there's, there's a two primary ways. There's a the psychologist has, has this way of looking at roles. And like myself, the sociologist has their way of looking at roles. The sociologist, would, we would say that we're, we're a production of the social experiences, whereas the psychologist would suggest we're a, we're a product of our internal narratives. And I think it's a yes and a yes. It's both. And so helping our kids, regardless of their age, navigate that social that, that role. Like what, is, what does a woman, what is her role? What is a man's role? What is, a gen what is the gender role in workplaces? And you could tell right now throughout our country we have all kinds of identity crisis in all of these roles. And a lot of these movements, these social movements, are just a reflection of, a, of, a, of the crisis associated with, with an identity. Uh, and so it becomes a big part of really kind of who we are and, and what we do. And, and as, we get, as we kind of walk into this, this idea of, of developing a family, we have to keep in mind there's a lot of things 
that influence families. Uh, certainly, you may not be able to see this. Okay, yeah, you may not be able to see this on here, but that inner circle says micro, uh, so small things. Uh, meso, that's just a little bit larger. Macro is a little bit larger. So we, in the family systems theory, uh, families are, they, we influence within. And then we have uh, influences like within our neighborhoods, in our communities, uh, white collar, blue collar, uh, ethnicity, those kind of things. And then the bigger ones is nations and legal systems. So there's a lot of, you think your child is only being influenced by what happens when they're with you. But the reality is a child grows, grows uh, they, they, more and more things are influencing them. I don't know if you realize, 100 years ago, uh, children were being influenced by what was occurring within uh, a, a day's drive of the buggy. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, talking about the Amish earlier, uh, that, the, their influence within a buggy's ride. Uh, our kids are influenced outside of that in, whether it's through their the transient nature of our communities where people aren't living where they were raised, or because, of course, the internet, uh, the different schooling platforms, whether it's public school or private school or home school, there's a lot of different influencers. And, and a lot of this stuff, we really can't control, but we could certainly observe. That's kind of what, what Paul was getting at when he wrote Romans 12 too. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Have you ever sat down and considered if you've got a nine-year-old, what's the pattern of their world? Uh, what's the emotional, spiritual, physical, educational pattern? Because that's what they're conforming to. It's like whittling. Uh, it's an intentional movement of the blade over the wood to shape into something that they see. Uh, we do not conform, but be transformed. So for us, it's all about awareness. It's, it's about stepping back for a second, thinking, okay, if I, got, if I got four kids, their age range is about 10 years, and so what are they, what's the pattern of their world? Uh, and and how, where do I see them conforming to that pattern? Too often we're so busy, we're trying to get through it, that we don't take time to think about that movement. And it happens slowly over time. It's, you know, you see it all the time with these kids. I mean, you, you see a kid once a year, and you're like, oh my goodness, you've grown insanely in the last year. But you see a child every day, you don't ever see their growth necessarily, which is why we have to put marks on the, on the, uh, on the wood around a doorway to make sure we realize, yeah, this kid is growing. <laughs> Despite the fact that all they eat is hot dogs and Cheetos, they are growing. And, and, but we have to mark it because it's so hard for us to see it when we're with them day in and day out. So the challenge, this part of the awareness of this first third of what we're talking about, the challenge is just to be aware uh, of the influencers, to be aware of the internal ones within your family system and the external ones. Uh, I, you, if you get into it, you, we know that divorce uh, stays in the family system three generations. Domestic abuse, drug and alcohol addiction, three generations. M my family, my wife's family, both sides, just, they, they were chuggers. I mean, fifth of day guys and girls. And, and so when we, our kids, were, we were raising them, we told them, we said, we, you know, if you want to drink, that's on you, but just be clear, there's a, one of you's got the beast. Uh, it's chained up. Just add alcohol. And so all, all four of our kids are now in their early 20s, and they're like, thanks, Dad, for ruining it for us because we're afraid. Of, uh, is the beast going to come out? Like the beauty, and the, I used to use the beauty and the beast as the image. They're like, oh, my gosh, Dad. <laughs> but it was, I, I didn't care if, if they were worried about that. Uh, if I was approaching it, I ha it was my responsibility to teach them about their family system. Down in the Indiana schools, they do a genogram with the high schoolers, which is like a family tree on steroids. And it's a relational family tree, a medical family tree, uh, and, and a genogram. And they have each one of the kids do it. And when they do it, they learn what the generational projection process is. I told the kids, there's three generations deep alcoholism. You can drink, but just be aware you have a predisposition to alcoholism. Whether it's genetic or not, or nurturing environment, I don't care. They have a predestination to, and it was my responsibility as a dad, and my wife's responsibility as a mom, to help them know that. And so the kids in our character children's home, when it's time, 
when they've dropped out of survival mode, we get into their backdrop because we want them to be aware of the backdrop. Uh, we always emerge out of something. So this is a big slide for me because the second part of Romans 12 too is, is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve. And that transform word in the Greek is, is, comes through the Latin as metamorphosis. Uh, it's the caterpillar crawling to the cocoon and it being transformed into something that it wasn't. But a little bit of it comes along for the ride. The worm is on the wings. <laughs> and, and I don't think the worm's making its wings. It's transformed. Uh, so we go through this process daily. Do not conform but be transformed. Do not, I mean, work, home, do not conform, be transformed. And so we have a, we have a huge role in that, in that movement, and, and it's important for us just to be aware of it. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, this next slide kind of summarizes the whole thing for us. I love, one of my friends is an Elvis impersonator. He fits my show perfectly. A guy named Matt Heigl. He's a preacher, Church of Christ preacher. Uh, he fought the fact that he looked like Elvis all through his 20s, and he finally succumbed to it. So, all right, I look like stupid Elvis. I'm going to do an Elvis impersonation. And that's what he did when I was serving at the Smoky Mountain Christian Church before I made God bad and he banished me to Northeast Indiana. I was serving with Matt Heigl uh, down in Pigeon Forge at the Smoky Mountain Christian Church. And, and, and I saw, when I found this cartoon, I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Uh, but it's got a punchline to it that'll make you stand up. Uh, it, where do we go from here? The challenge is to develop an identity in Christ, right? Uh, but this, this caption's powerful. Uh, the dad's talking to the son. The dad says, shoot, son, if you work real hard and stick to it, I reckon, I love that word, I reckon, uh, I reckon you can grow up to impersonate anyone you want. The children in our care 20-somethings, 15-year-olds, whatever, it doesn't matter what their age range is, they are susceptible to the chameleon effect. They define their worth through their peer culture. Uh, and, and so if you work real hard and stick to it, I reckon you can impersonate anyone you want. So that's the challenge. Why in the world are we here on a Sunday night? We want to help these kids uh, find their identity in Christ. That's the only solution. Uh, Paul talks all over the letters about his in Christness, and that's a teaching that we can't lose sight of. He found his identity in Christ, in Christ alone, and that's our that's our challenge. Uh, and and if we do that, and if we stay focused on that that goal, uh, this development stuff just fits right in. It's like, oh yeah, so where are the tools to do this? Well, that's what we're going to get into is is the tools to do this. So, any questions? Snide comments? Okay, so let me, uh, this next slide uh, is going to, come on, Mr. Next Slide. Yes, so how do we manage conflict? You know, I, I got this little candle here, and, and conflict is inevitable, right? It's, like, it's, as in, it's as inevitable as lighting a candle, right? Letting it, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. Remember I told you earlier today I light candles, set the tone, go over to turn on Simon and Garfunkel, bridge over troubled water, and just feel, just feel sorry for myself. I, I used to do that, like, just dim the lights and feel sorry for myself and worry. So we're not doing that today. So we're not dimming the lights. You're not worrying. But this represents problems. This represents conflict. And, and, and if I take one of these uh, fancy dancy balloons, is there any kids in the room? <laughs> okay, good. So uh, if I take one of these kids in the room, one, one of these kids in the room, put them over to flay, we'll see what happens. No, if I take, if I take, if I take one of these balloons and put it over the, balloon, over the fire, it's pretty obvious we know what's going to happen, right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist. I mean, uh, ooh. so, yes, it blows up. And, and you'll be like, well, that's, the blue represents a guy. I know. The blue represents a guy, and they tend to overreact. So let's just get the ladies out. Uh, and and uh, I have a green balloon to represent the ladies because my wife's birthday is tomorrow, and she's not here. So this is her. And so when she goes walking through the park one day in the, in the beautiful month of May, and she comes across a problem, it doesn't, just like the guy, she just, and she's a little bit louder. I blew that one up a little louder. So conflict, what we know about families, you know, our, our privileged responsibility to model, to, to uh, monitor the conforming, transforming process, to, to keeping in mind what we're projecting down, our fears, our joys, uh, what, what makes us laugh, 
what makes us cry. As we, as we kind of have that in our backdrop, you know, one of the things that, it, that we recognize pretty quickly is it doesn't take much for conflict to brew. Uh, conflict is typically rooted in communication, a miscommunication. It doesn't take, and, and we think we're communicating with someone when we're really not. Uh, we, we tend to lose sight of the fact that sometimes we're speaking in German and they're hearing in Spanish, and, and especially our kids. We think they're hearing us, but they're not. Or if they are, what they're hearing is so different than what we had, had thought they were hearing. It's like I, one time up at a, I was preaching at the Auburn Church of Christ for seven years, and when, I used to love preaching on, on giving do it twice a year, two weeks per time. So four, four weeks a year, I'd preach on giving. And the one particular sermon series on giving, I was preaching on the faithfulness of God. We can give of our time, talents, and treasures radically because God's faithful. He'll always fill in the cracks. And I went through this series on the faithfulness of God, how we should just feed on his faithfulness, give of our time, talents, and treasures. And and it connected real well with my heart and therefore with the church's heart. And a couple weeks later, a lady called me from the church, and, and I went over to her house, and her mom was there. They both attended the church, and mom was crying. Uh, she had this little front room in the house. Mom was crying, and so I made some dumb jokes and tried to make her smile, and she did. And then finally, we, we kind of sat. I'm like, so what's going on? What, what are you upset about? And, and she said, uh, your sermons have given me the strength to divorce my husband. I'm like... You do realize that wasn't the thesis. <laughs> and, and she's like, and, and well, it turns out she was in a, a, a physically abusive uh, relationship. So domestic abuse, broken arms, uh, pushed down steps. And the abusers in domestic abuse build silos that keeps the, the prey uh, in the silo. And they build these silos so that they can't see out of them. They have to live in the silo. Why does, a, why does a person stay in an abusive relationship? Because his silo is built over him. And, and that his, his particular silo around her was, she was like 65. If you leave me, you'll be homeless. And she was terrified to be homeless. So he built this silo of threats with her. And, and, and my sermon series on the faithfulness of God gave her the strength to step out of that abusive relationship because she knew God would provide for her. He would be faithful. So you, you never know what people hear, but you can, you can guarantee one thing. What they hear is, is based on where they live. Uh, there's one thing to, to, to have the ear, the bones in your ears vibrate and have it connect into your brain to define it, but, but the, 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 the objectivity of it is their, is their world. So you're telling an eight-year-old you're valuable. And that eight-year-old just came out of the cafeteria uh, being made fun of because they laugh weird or because they chew weird uh, or they sneezed and all their food came out and they're made to feel like an idiot. Uh, and so you're telling this child they're valuable. They're thinking, I'm not valuable. Uh, my peer group just convinced me I'm not valuable. So we have, to, we have to be aware that the conflict isn't just yelling at each other. It's the conflict between my identity in Christ and what I'm experiencing. That's usually the, co the core of conflict is the warring of the identities. And it's like, it's like, well, that's a little heavy. Yeah, it is a little heavy, but it's, it's the reality of it. Like uh, the kids in our care to children's home, no matter what you tell them, they feel like throwaways. doesn't matter if the children's home is the best place for them to be, the safest place for them to be. They do better in school. They do better in all their relationships, but they still feel like a throwaway. Uh, because that's what their identity has become. So we, over time, we chip away at that, just chip away at it. And so how to manage conflict is part of the chipping away of that. So there's four steps in my brain on how to manage conflict. How do you keep the balloon from bursting? And the first one is, it sounds a little weird, like Barbie-ish, like the Barbie movie, like, like the emotional set point. Sorry, I don't know if anybody likes the Barbie movie. Didn't mean to throw that out there. But the, uh, the emotional set point. What's the emotional set point of your home? Uh, like I told you, the home I was raised in, the emotional set point was two degrees below boiling. Any infraction, <laughs> boiled over. Uh, and so that was the emotional set point. I had no clue what was going on. Uh, my sister and I had no clue that was the emotional set point. But, but it's a good question. What's the, what's the emotional set point? 
of, of your home, of your cubicle, of your, of your Facebook or your social media posts? What's the emotional set point uh, of, of how you drive? Because there's different set points in our different social uh, environments. And, and so what's the emotional set point? Uh, it, it, it's pretty consistent across our social uh, atmosphere, landscapes, but it can change. Uh, so we, we, my wife and I, set out to try to understand, are we two degrees below boiling? Because the reality is, I was raised two degrees below boiling, and guess how I was raising my kids for the first six years? Two degrees below boiling. Uh, even though I absolutely hated that experience as a kid, I was reproducing that in my family. Why does a daughter of an alcoholic marry an alcoholic? Why does a, a, a person being physically abused, witness domestic abuse as a child, uh, marry an abuser? It's, it's, there is a, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of answers why, but they're not worth getting into tonight, but the reality is that happens. The daughter of an alcoholic marries an alcoholic. They reproduce the emotional atmosphere of the home they were raised in in their family as adults. So we know that now, and we could say, okay, here's the gut check. What's our emotional set point? Uh, is it two degrees below boiling? And, and does grace and mercy permeate the air? You know, grace is getting what we don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what we do deserve. You know, I used to demand justice until I grew up, and I was like, oh, I don't want justice. <laughs> I would rather get not what I deserve. <laughs> and, and so, is your home a retreat? Oh, it's a big, yes, please. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, that's a perfect, so the emotional set point, it's almost like when we, when we come into, um, like, like the emotional set point, it, it, it could be understood as, like, a good example would be irritability. Like, oh, that person's just irritable. Uh, or, their, or their emotional set points, like I know some, this one woman at the, at the Auburn Church of Christ, she just had this sense of, I exhaled when I stood next to her. She had this sense, she calmed me uh, because that was her set point. She was just calm. And so it brought me down to her level. She'd come to me before I preach, and she's like, how you feeling, Pastor Joe? I'm like, and she's like, just stand next to me for a second. And I was like, ah, Yes. Can you please come on stage with me for a second? <laughs> so just like this morning in the first service, I just felt so keyed up. Uh, and so, so the emotional set point is like, are they irritable? Uh, can, can the kids make infractions? Do you, are you, do you cause people to exhale? That's kind of what I'm getting at there. So uh, the emotional set point, it, it's, it's interesting how it flows around, uh, especially in our homes. And that's why I like to use the word atmosphere. Like what's the atmosphere of your home? Uh, my wife's grandmother used to always say that home should be a retreat, should be a safe place to escape to. Uh, and, and some people are raised in homes like that, and some people aren't. Uh, and so it's just a matter of gut checking where we're at. Uh, I remember, never forget one of our, one of our daughters, she, she came home from school, and I made it a point, and I'll talk about this later, that I was home two days a week when she got off the school bus, because that was my commitment to the family. And she comes walking up the street, and she was walking a little weird, and she's a middle schooler, and, you know, they're whack jobs. So I just didn't think much about it. And then she came across the grass, and she was definitely not, something was wrong. And, and so she got across the grass, and I met her at the door, and she stepped into our house, into our home, and she just started just bawling, just completely bawling. And I was like, goodness, Katie, what's going on? And she didn't have the, she couldn't actually speak. She was crying so hard. Uh, later on, we found out that something had happened at the lunchroom table, uh, and she held that in through sixth period, seventh period, all the way home on the bus, all the way up the street, all the way across our lawn until she got into our home. And then she felt safe to ah, let it out. And thankfully, at that particular moment in time, I wasn't focused on her homework or her chores or her messy room. I just let her be who she was. And that was a big deal for our family to experience that. We were a retreat. Uh, and so the emotional set point sets up the retreatness of your home and this church and all your social environments. And, and so that's a big thing, what energy you bring into it. I used to work in Newark as an engineer, and I lived in, just outside of Philadelphia, 
That's a psycho drive with maniacs on the road. Uh, they, they wave claw hammers at you. They don't shoot you in, in, in Newark. They, they'd, rather, they'd rather hit you with a claw hammer. They want to get some of you on them. You know, like when I was living in L.A., they'd shoot you. But in, in, in Philly, in New York, they want to hit you with a hammer instead. And so, <laughs> crazy. So I would come home after the 74-mile commute, and I was strung pretty tight. And I'd come into the house, and what's here? What's that mess there? What are you doing? Why are you freaking out? I mean, I brought just... I just brought negativity into the house. So the guy who was working with me, one of the guys who was disciple me, said, so Joe, why don't you go to a park and sit there for five minutes and breathe for a few minutes before you go home? He said, don't go where there's kids. They'll think you're a creeper. But they go to a... <laughs> and he said, also, get some pretzels, too, because you're probably hungry. So I would sit there, and I would eat the pretzels, and I would just rest for five minutes. And then the energy I brought into the house was more of a helper to my wife, who was a stay-at-home mom, than it was the garbage I had experienced on the road coming home. So these are just thoughts for us. The emotional set point. I remember I caught myself watching a Christmas, I caught myself on, on a, before I was in Christ, they were opening presents on Christmas morning, and they were doing it dumb, and I was yelling at them, and they were video recording it, and then years later I watched myself, I was like, oh my gosh, the look on my face. You know, I was yelling at them as they were opening presents, trying to teach them about grace. So I just... The emotional, <laughs> and so, and I'm just going to rotate through these couple of ones, but how do you lower it? I mean, we could talk about emotional set points, but the, 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 how do you lower the set point? So you have 100 degrees before you blow, boil over. Right? Well, for me, it's, it's reducing commitments. Stop saying yes all the time. I think, I think it was 2019, I spoke like 78 times uh, traveling. I was tired. <laughs> My set point had risen. I was, I was irritable all the time. Uh, I Balanced life. Uh, eat well, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Eat well, be with people, uh, sleep well, all that kind of stuff. Keeping a big picture in mind, uh, most of the stuff we get upset about have no eternal significance. It, it really doesn't matter if the stupid room's clean or not. Uh, do, are they developing an identity in Christ? It's important for the room to be clean, but that's not the main thing. I found that I had to say no to a lot of things in order to say yes to the main thing. And that was important for me, our family. It was a transition for us, this stuff. Uh, and of course, the spiritual exercises of prayer and fasting and, and, and uh, silence. <laughs> that was a funny one for me. Can you shut up for just eight hours, Joe? <laughs> so, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's been a movement in development, but it has caused me to be less irritable, uh, more willing to listen, as opposed to fixing. Just, it's more willing to just be present in people. And it turns out, if I do that, my conflict is a lot more manageable. And that's the goal. Because every conflict has an opportunity for development built into it. So this next one is the, the uh, habit. Now, we could talk three hours about habits, you know, I'm a lefty with brushing my teeth. I throw a baseball righty. Uh, and, and I don't even think about that I grab the toothbrush with my left hand. It's my habit. And these habits are stored deep in our brains. We could have brain injuries and still know how to brush our teeth. It's amazing. So the habits, it's you have a trigger, the associated behavior, and then the reward. Like I said earlier today, driving home, someone pulls out in front of you, that's the trigger. That's an associated behavior. I'm going to tell them they're number one in the most antisocial way, or I'm going to pray for them. Uh, there's an associated behavior with every single trigger. And there's a reward. I feel like I'm back in control. It's like for me, I, I love eggs. I eat eggs all the time. I take these eggs. When I see an egg, some people, they, they have an egg in their hand, and, and, and they're, that's the trigger. The egg's in my hand. Their routine is you, you crack the egg, and, and then you make eggs. Of course, as a kid, when I had egg in my hand, my, my, my response was to throw it at somebody. Yeah. Or, or it's like, I just throw it over here. It's like, what? Ah! But there, I sucked the yolks out of them earlier. I just, weirdest things. My wife has caught me sucking the yolk out of eggs. But it's just, my pregnant daughter saw me doing it once and she threw up. I was like, that, that was the funniest thing in the world. But and it's the part about the, the, the habit loop. Some people hold an egg and they want to have eggs. Some people hold an egg like a juvenile delinquent like me, and I want to throw an egg at somebody. It's the trigger. And we have most of our conflict begins with a trigger. I can't believe she said that to me. Uh, even though what she said wasn't actually meant to be uh, dismantling, 
uh, but it had that effect on me because of what I was emerging out of. Uh, most conflict begins with a trigger. Now, if we keep the emotional set point down, we can be triggered more and not boil over. So they all kind of fit together. But the, the daughter, the son, 12 years old, coming out of school, they're running pretty high, and then you tell them to put their phone away because we're having dinner, and they trigger over. Uh, or you, why, why is your room a pigsty? They trigger over. My son's room was such a pigsty as a teenager that I used to blow my nose and throw my dirty tissues in his room. He'd be like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's a pigsty. I don't care. It's a garbage can. I throw my tissues in there. He got so ragingly angry. I mean, how he's actually going to hit me. But uh, I was trying to prove a point. <laughs> if, you, if you live like a pig, you're going to be treated like a pig. But the, uh, it didn't land a blow until he was in the army. But it did eventually land a blow. So the trigger, uh, recognizing how you manage conflict. Because how I manage conflict, I learned from my dad. And he learned from his dad. And he learned from his dad. Three generations of alcoholism. I manage conflict based on what I learned as a child. Now, thankfully, God has designed us so that we can grow through that with awareness. And we had to do a gut check. My wife, she would shut down because of her abusive situation. They shut down. My, my family, we threw stuff at each other. So neither one is real healthy. <laughs> and so we... We had to ask ourselves, when we walk into conflict, what is my knee-jerk reaction? Is it silent scorn, slamming the cabinet doors? Is it shutting down, which it's okay to shut down as long as we come back to it. Is it exploding? Is it falling in around trying to fix it, fix it, fix it? What's, what's our conflict management default setting? If you read some of the scriptures, you'll find that Saul had one, King David had one, the Apostle Paul had one. They all had default settings to how they manage conflict. It's very interesting to look at the scriptures through some of this stuff. It's really, it's really very fascinating. And there's a lot of really neat books on that. But, but it's good for us to understand uh, the habit loop. Because your children, regardless of their age, they have an automated response to conflict. Maybe it's, I'm being made fun of. Uh, because I'm not vaping, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to participate, so I'm not made fun of anymore. The conflict is um, outside looking in at my peer culture, and there's the easiest way to get into that peer culture is just to do what they say. So it's, it's, it's not just arguing about where to put the sugar in the kitchen or why you spend the money on that. It's all types of conflict. We have to open up our definition of what conflict is. It's, it's the warring between identities. My identity in Christ that I experienced at Novesta and youth group in my identity in the school. Uh, and that, that, that going back and forth. So this is a big deal because we invest this. The trigger leads to an action that leads to reward. And if the reward is good, we're going to invest in it. That's why the cigarette companies got sued for so much money uh, because they got the kids to invest in smoking very, very quickly with the chemicals that they were putting on the tobacco. Guess what the vaping companies are doing? The exact same kind of chemicals. And these kids invest in it right away. They don't even know they're investing in it, but it's a, it's a biological investment. They can't, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan's wife just said, you know, her thing, just say no. Well, that, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. It didn't work. That's why they stopped printing those posters. It doesn't work. It just makes people feel horrible. And so, that's a big deal for, so with your kids, helping them to understand, my kids understand the habit loop. Simple. It's trigger, reward, routine, reward. I drove a circle with them and I just taught them. 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds. We always talk about the habit loop. It's important. Uh, and so the challenge for the habit loop is to slow, to slow down. To slow down. Like, like James said, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Slow down. If I slow down, I could recognize the trigger. I could feel the routine kicking in, and I could say, ah, that dismantles my relationship with this person. I'm not going to respond like that today. And then I find a different way. Instead of reacting, I respond. So slowing down, what would Jesus do is a big one. Uh, I love that one, but that's really hard to do in the heat of the moment, unless, you have, unless we have unwrapped the gift, the gift of pause. If we unwrap the gift of pause, 
Then we could ask ourselves what Jesus would do. Um, but most of the time, it's at the end of the day. And if you're not reviewing your day at the end of the day, I highly recommend you start that spiritual practice. It's a very powerful practice. We've taught our kids how to inventory their day. Like, so what was my day like in the morning? What did I experience? What did I experience in the afternoon? It just takes five minutes. Uh, and we pray. We pray about that. Uh, but it's really a really powerful journey just to review the day. Because we learn so much better in retrospect. The rearview mirror is so much more clearer than the windshield when we're running through life. And so this is a big way. This is, I love this part of, of managing conflict. The third thing, of course, is to recognize the triggers. And this is where the development comes in. Grief is a perfect example. Recognizing the triggers. Uh, grief is a, huge, is a huge thing that a lot of our kids go through, and we don't even call it grief. Uh, grief could be leaving elementary school and going to middle school. That's terrifying for a kid to come out of a little pool and go into the bigger pool. Or moving. That's a big, big thing. We moved our kids away from their whole family system. We went from Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, down to East Tennessee. I didn't speak their language down there. <laughs> we went out for dinner. We first got down there. My wife asked the waitress for a, a glass of water, and the waitress looked at her dead in the eye and said, I don't care to. I was like, where I'm from, that's fighting words. What do you mean you don't care to, loser? This is what you're getting paid for. I, I, was, I was really upset. And, and so she walked away. I was like, so she came back a few minutes later carrying a glass of water, and she saw that we reacted. She's like, oh, down here, I don't care to means, oh, I don't mind. Well, why didn't you say that? I didn't speak their language. <laughs> it's, but grief is a big deal. We, and our son, he had his two best friends died in a car accident when he was 16. They were all football players, and right before the Friday night football game, they were all going to go over to the cheerleader's house, and they decided to hop out of the car except for two of them, and they just made a mistake. They pulled out in front of someone, someone doing 45, and they both died instantly. And so that was a huge point of conflict. How in the world do we define this? That night, there was over 80 kids at our house uh, walking around our property trying to define what they just experienced. Because that's what kids do at that age group. They define their experiences in their peer group. We're just talking heads. And so they, they didn't know what to do, so they, they come to the preacher's house. I mean, they were coming anywhere and eating all of our food. So they just came back anyway, and, and we, we weren't able to define it with them. We just, we ended up going to the Church of Christ and just, just we had a candlelight service. We just held up those candles that you do at the Silent Night, Holy Night thing on, on Christmas Eve, and, and we just tried to bring light into the darkness. But that, that kicked off five years of teaching our son how to grieve. Have you taught your children how to grieve? Have you introduced the five stages of grief? If you don't teach them, who in the world will? And so this is a big deal. Conflict isn't just about, isn't just about disagreeing. It's, it's that rub. It's that rub between predictability and unpredictability. And so we, these, so for our son, that was a trigger for him. Big time. Of course, I'm a, I'm a minister. I do a lot. I officiate a lot of funerals. Every single one of those funerals were a trigger for him. <sighs> Huge. And we had to journey into that with him in a big way. It wouldn't get me all choked up. Uh, he's 23 now, doing really well. But it was tough for a while. And, and when my mother died two, two years ago, it just brought all that stuff back. Because he had the brain of a 16-year-old which is about half developed. At 25 years old is when all the brain is fully developed. He was trying to process grief with a brain that wasn't fully developed. We needed to process that with him. And that was a huge thing for us. That was a trigger. Uh, whether it was on a TV show, uh, if he saw a car accident, if he smelled a car accident, all that stuff, to heard a car accident, it's all triggers for that stuff. So it's, it's important for us to look at the the triggers. Uh, may, maybe it's a, abuse from the past, or, or maybe it's a, a routines, or, or money, or every family system's got triggers. And for us, it's just a matter of identifying them. Sitting down with a piece of paper with your family and saying, so what triggers us? What causes problems? You'd be surprised what your kids would tell you. You may not like it, <laughs> but you'll be surprised what they would tell you. If you give them a voice, they will give you what they're thinking. And it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. I remember I was preaching on availability, predictability, and, and uh, uh, 
available print, and accountability, a three-week sermon series, and I was, I was loving it, and I was just deep into the scriptures with it, the church was tracking, and I was available and printable and accountable, that's our challenge, and yay, and so we went out to dinner after the third week, and, and my kids, we always talk about my sermons, and they make fun of me and tell me I'm dumb, and, and I, I look weird, and my daughter draws, she draws, she draws smiley faces on my notes, so I smile when I talk, but uh, I was talking to them about it, and, and Katie's like, she's like, yeah, that's a really good message, Joe. Because she calls me Joe. That's what her, that's how she messes with me. And so, instead of dad, unless she wants money. But she said, that was really good messages, Joe. But, uh, but too bad you're not available for us. And I'm like, what? And she, and they went on to all of them agreed, including my wife. She was on their team. And I was like, and I got really defensive. That was the trigger. I was really upset. But I held it in. And, and because they were, I, I'd given them a voice. And I can't, I can't assassinate them because they used their voice. And I had to do a gut check. I wasn't available for them. I had to stop answering my phone when I was in the middle of a conversation with them. I had to start making sure I was... I did, I did a bunch of things in response to that conversation over the next two years, but that was tough stuff. But, but that's part of... We, 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 we identify triggers. And it's important for us to do that with our kids. Uh, and the last little bit here is, is, is uh, of course, this, this is how you discuss them intentionally. Uh, respect the multiple points of view, and have special communication. Uh, that's how we deal with the triggers. This last little step here, because I'm going to uh, take maybe a five-minute break after this. This last little step here is, is uh, learning how to fight fair in a sandbox. So we, we recognize our emotional set point affects the conflict. We, we know that we have triggers, and we have predictable ways of responding to conflict. A- and then we have... uh, we identify the triggers and the last place is when we get into conflict uh, there should be fair rules of engagement and and that's what we uh we created this list if we're gonna talk about me not being available we're gonna stay on topic i'm not gonna rotate to your rooms of pigsty and and you and you you were late last week we're gonna stay on topic uh i'm gonna listen really hard for me to do. I'm, too, I'm always so right, right there wanting to formulate my response. James said, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And, and all these other things. Uh, resolve the issue in a day. Uh, we made a commitment to do these things as a family. Learn to disagree. We had to learn to disagree. Uh, we have four kids. I, don't, I can't believe they came from my wife and I. They're freakishly different, every single one of them. I mean, we have the Neanderthal son. We have the hipster doofus. We have the artist. And we have a stay-at-home mom. I mean, they're just completely, I don't know where these kids came from. But uh, we had to recognize that we're going to agree to disagree. And our, our adult kids don't agree uh, between them about roles and gender roles and stuff. And, and, and we had to teach them how to disagree in a way that honors the other person. And it's all part of our goal here is to manage. We have to intentionally teach our kids how to manage conflict. And if we do that, we'll find that, you know, the the nails don't ever fall. Uh, And if they do, it's really obvious. Uh, Like my desk, when the nails fall, it's really obvious because they don't fall very often. And and so that's the challenge here is is to kind of step through that. And if we do that... If we manage the conflict, then we're on the developmental path. Uh, that identity in Christ is, is, is clicking along. This last little slide. Yep. So we can stop here for five minutes if you want, uh, or we can keep on plowing. That's just a family portrait of the children's home. So it's kind of my stopping point. It's up to you. We're at 6, 11, and 3 seconds. You know, Apple owns the time, so... They own everything else. And so I guess that's what time it is. But we can take five-minute break or raise your hand if you want to keep on plowing. We've got about 20 minutes left. Okay, keep on plowing. All right, good. So uh, the, the next thing here is, is my favorite part, uh, which is talking about development. Uh, the goal, which we talked about, the, all these things are just a, a rehash. Uh, healthy families produce healthy Christian churches. Unhealthy families produce unhealthy Christian churches. And by the way, Novesta, man, you guys have an energy here that is powerful. It's very attractive. You don't need billboards. Uh, You don't need to promote what you're doing here because it's very attractive. And it's obvious. Last time I was here, uh, you guys were about a third of what you are now. You're attracting people 
uh, and that's powerful. And so the goal is to intentionally develop each family member, not surviving but thriving and so on. And, uh, and then the next part is how do we develop Christian families? Well, we started in the beginning, got to be intentional, and, and you got to do with that air of permanency. And so that's what takes us to this last, these last two slides. Um, this is a great, by the way, these slides are going to be available. I said that earlier, but I just want to remind you, this is a great tool right here for helping kids develop. Ask and consider with your child their shape. You know, you can't see the circle here, but the inner circle is genetic traits, right? There's some genetic traits associated with, with us. And, and it's, oh, it, there it just is. Uh, and then there's Myers-Briggs does like personality assessments. Are you, are you sensing? Are you intuitive? I'm a, I'm a sensing person. I get data in. I love spreadsheets. I like, I live with spreadsheets. I got a spreadsheet for the spreadsheets. I mean, I just, just it, fe it feeds my, Vicky's like, my wife's like, oh my gosh, I don't care about your stupid spreadsheet. How much money do we have? But look at the spreadsheets. I can tell you. And so, so it's a, so intuition, sensing, or Vicky, my wife once bought a car because it winked at her. She thought it was, she felt like it was the right car. And it was, the, unfortunately, the best car we ever owned. I was so upset because I had, I had done my research and it wasn't the right car. But uh, Myers-Briggs does assessments on our personalities. But, and the DISC is another one with a behavioral response to our, our environment. If you're not talking about this with your kids, I can guarantee your kids are talking about this with other people. Whether they call it anagrams or whatever it is, it, it's, it, we might as well just be intentional about it. Uh, and give them, these are three really good uh, ways of looking at why they do what they do. And that's always, it's always part of that identity. Why do I do what I do? And so, but the shape is a really great little acronym. Uh, I didn't create it. It's, there's information that's been around since the 80s. Uh, so the S stands for spiritual gifts. Every child, because we're made in the image of God, right? And inherent worth and value, Everybody has a spiritual gift, and the, and the Greek word for gift is, is charis, and it could be, it could be rendered grace. It's a, we've received something. Maybe the, maybe the gift is a gift of administration, or the gift is, it could be the gift of generosity, or the gift of faith, or whatever it is. There's gifts, there's a heart, there's a passion, uh, there's abilities. Like as a kid, I had a severe in speech impediment. I was hardly intelligible. For the first couple of years of my life, it kind of goes along with abuse, and, and, but I learned to speak. But there's still like 8, 10, 20 words I don't say uh, publicly because I can't pronounce them correctly. Because whoever created those words were dumb, and they created words I couldn't say. But, no, I, but you could learn. You could, like, I can't sing, but I could probably learn if I tried real hard. But personality. So your children have budding personalities introvert versus extrovert, which doesn't mean shy versus outgoing. It more has to do with where we're losing energy. Do you lose energy with people or do you gain energy with people? I'm actually an introvert uh, because I, I you know, after like today, this morning, after I finished all that, I went and sat quietly for three hours by myself. I was going to go visit some friends. I'm like, nope, I need to recharge. I've been around way too many humans today. And so I went and just sat silent uh, for three hours. I watched some football, but I, sat, I just sat there and just recharged because I needed to gain energy. Uh, introverts, so some of your kids are going to be introverts and, and you're going to wonder why they get whiny after they're in a social setting because they need to go reach. And we taught our kids, our middle daughter, we're like, you're an introvert. When you come out of school, you need to go sit and recharge. And she started doing that. Her whole attitude and behavior changed just with that little bit of knowledge. Uh, experiences, they all fit together. Right, like for me, I hate to use myself as an example, but so, you know, grew up in a messy home. That's my experience. Uh, my passion is to help kids. God's given me abilities and gifts for it, and I have a personality that fits it. So a lot of times in the journey of life, we realize our shape. Now I'm 55. I didn't realize my shape until I was in my late 40s. It takes time. And people had to tell me this stuff. And I had to understand it. I was like, why did you call me the Northeast Indiana God? Well, because he had a plan for me to serve at the Woodburn Christian Children's Home. I had no clue. I wish he had told me. I wouldn't have been so whiny about it. Uh, there's only three alleyways in Auburn, and I'm an alley dweller. I think in the alleyways, and I was, I was walking the alleys in Auburn trying to think, why in the world Northeast Indiana? Uh, uh, and, but now I know why. 
it just took time for it to, so your kids are going to wrestle with that why in the world am i where i am and it and you're going to be able to provide this top-down view you are where you are because your shape is forming and I'm going to help you form your shape. And so this, there's some great scriptures that go with it. It's very, very biblical thought. And, and this last little one is kind of like the destination. There's a lot of moving parts, but what it boils down to is, is this is family development 101. And I actually changed the word from child to family because we can't just look at our kids' developments because their development is directly proportional and related to the family's development. Uh, they do not live in little isolated, severe, like eggs like this. That's one of those words I can't say. S P H E R E, that word. Yeah, that's a dumb word. Whoever created that word, I mean, I don't know why, because I can't, that's the word I, I saw my list. But uh, they don't live in these little, they come out of the eggs. And, and, and so their development is part of our development, right? So, Physical, educational, emotional, and spiritual. Like, well, gosh, if that's a destination, you could have told me that in the beginning. We could have left already. It is, but we had to get to that place. It's like the four sides of a puzzle. There's a physical, there's an educational, there's an emotional, there's a spiritual. And, and the children, they're all over, you know, they're all interrelated. Like, like the toothbrush thing. If, if you teach a kid how to brush their teeth, there's a physical component. Are they lefty or are they righty? Uh, there's an educational component, you know, get the egg timer out, 60 seconds, brush up, down, back, you know, our, our family, you know, the, the, the generational projection process in my family is we hate dentists. I don't know if you guys, is there any dentists in the room? <laughs> Good. So he just, ah, but uh, uh, there's an educational component to it, teaching the kid how to brush your teeth. There's an emotional component because they feel better. There's, there's actually, if you eat ice cream, your brain scream and go brush your teeth because it leaves a film on your teeth, and, and your brain's saying, brush it off. It's a really interesting, and there's a spiritual component. If we're made in the image of God, we take care of ourselves. All of the girls who come into our care have hygiene problems. It's their repellent uh, from being abused. Uh, and so, so we, we work with them on this, because for them, it's very, it's very dangerous and scary to be presentable. Uh, and, and so that's just the world we live in at, at the children's home. You may not live in that world, but that's where we live at. But, but it all rotates. Every single thing that kids do, have they rotate through it in a biblical worldview. They define life through that. So for us as adults, there's a big challenge associated with this. And, and the big challenge has a lot to do with are we providing an opportunity to do this with our kids? It's a gut check. Uh, physical, you know, what's, and my wife and I had to do this periodically because we wander. Uh, we, we end up wandering in, into life habits that take apart the development process. It's just natural. You know, like, so we, every so often, we'll gut check our, our diet. What's our diet? Because what we're eating, our kids are going to be eating. Uh, and so, uh, exercise. Uh, physical, work ethics, the rhythm of our day, hobbies. Have you ever talked to your child about what their hobby is? Uh, kids have lost the sense of a hobby these days. Uh, their phones are like their hobbies. But like, is, is, I think every kid needs a hobby. Every grandkid needs a hobby. Uh, grandfathers have a great way of introducing hobbies into, and grandmothers into children's lives. Uh, I think it's important for everybody to have a hobby. It's not, they're not doing it for marks or for uh, to prove they have worth. They're just doing it because they enjoy it. Uh, I had really good hobbies for a couple of years through the Boy Scouts, and I lost all of them uh, until I came to Christ when I was 33, and I've gone back into hobbies. Uh, and I, I love playing with Lincoln Logs. <laughs> Does anybody play with Lincoln Logs? Watching, yes. Do you, do you watch golf as well at the same time? No, okay. Well, we're close. <laughs> but, but I do that. I, I'll play with Lincoln in my back room after talking all morning long. I'll stay in the back room and I'll play with Lincoln Logs and watch golf. It's just how I recharge. But that rhythm, we teach the kids this rhythm through our own lives. Uh, and it's really important for us to, to model that, that recreation, that time management, uh, and, and educational. Do, do, how, do, how does the family value education? Uh, 
And when I say education, I don't just mean academics, but it's also life skill. Uh, the, the, who's teaching the kids how to dewinterize the lawnmower? Uh, who's teaching the kids how to, how to know if, if, if you need to leave the water trickling because it's going to be too cold outside? Uh, are, who, what about changing tires in a car or sewing or knitting? All these really cool... I, my son came home from football practice with a knit hat. I was like, where'd you get that hat from? I thought he stole it. And he's like, no, Dad. <laughs> It's because you steal things. doesn't mean I do, because he called me all that. But he, he said, my football coach knits. And I'm like, no way. He does. He knitted because it kept his hands busy. He was, he was like me all the time. And so he, he would knit the football players' hats. It was a hobby. So my son all of a sudden started knitting. I was like, oh, I didn't see that one coming. But, uh, <laughs> but life skill and education, valuing education, uh, not something to get through, uh, the teacher doesn't like me, that's why I'm failing. It's a place of, it's a place of, it's an opportunity to manage conflict. Emotional is a big, big thing. Teaching the process of grief, uh, the process of developing identity, uh, learning how to attach, how to make friends. I, my, my son-in-law, when he was in our youth group down in Tennessee, uh, it was ha- Halloween time, so I had this, I was teaching the kids in the youth group how to pick friends. And so there was a whole bunch of girls, and a whole, there was about 20 or 30 people in this youth group, and, and uh, I, I got these candy apples. And so we had a candy apple eating contest, girls versus boys. And the boys loved that because they, they wanted to look at the girls anyway. So uh, I put three apples down in front of the girls, and I gave them 60 seconds to eat as many, uh, much of the apples they could, and they did. They were, they were chomping them down, and it was a boy's turn. And I picked three boys who were driving me crazy. Every youth group's got three boys that drive you absolutely insane. And, and so I picked those three. And, and, and I, I got them all set and ready to go. And, and I was just ready to put it down. But, but before I put it down in this story, let me tell you that I took three onions and put caramel on them. And, and so I put it down. And, and, uh, and I said, ready, set, go. And they started chomping down these caramel onions. And in about 45 seconds into it, they realized what they were eating. But my future son-in-law took him about 55 seconds. He said he tasted onions for like three weeks. But the whole, I was teaching them how to pick friends because things, people don't always, they're not always as they appear. And that was the lesson. But that's what we teach our kids. It is all about this emotional component, which is so big to these kids at this age, how to participate in relational triangles, how to, how to make friends, and, and how to make friends with adults, too. There's a thing uh, that the Fuller Institute did a couple of years, about 20 years ago, and it's called the Sticky Faith Initiative. And what it was is they, they were trying to analyze, so why do kids graduate the church when they graduate high school? Why do all of our kids disappear when they turn 18? And, and they found that if, if the kids in the church have five relationships with adults outside of their family, they typically don't graduate the church when they graduate high school. So we, in, we implemented that at a church I was serving in, and we called it the Sticky Faith Initiative. Keep the kids stuck to the faith. But we, we were surprised how, how these kids didn't know how to have relationships. They didn't know how to have relationships with adults outside of their family. So we became, our youth minister became, this became his thing. He's going to teach these kids how to have relationships with adults outside of the family in the context of the church. And it was a great, a great experience for the church, and we had a great, a great response from the kids. And, and the big thing, the last thing here is, is the spiritual component. Uh, the church is our helper. The church is not the primary spiritual teacher of, of your children or my children. It was my responsibility, my wife and I's responsibility. The church only, sees my, only saw my kids two hours a week. I was stuck with them 118 hours a week. What are, that was if they were sleeping eight hours a night. And so I was the primary teacher for my children. And so I had to help them understand the Bible and its, and its wholeness, the goal of the Bible, how each story fits into the Bible. And that was a little scary for my wife because she was like, she needed to learn so she could teach our kids uh, Christianity. And, and we can't farm that out. Uh, it's our responsibility as an adult of the children in our family to, to be the primary spiritual teacher. Now, you can go to Brad and the other folks and, and, Brad's wife, and say, hey, so what do I do with this? I want to teach this. How, and they'll give you tons of resources, and you'll have, all, you'll have all you need, but it still it happens in your living room. Like I said earlier today, the kitchen's for cooking, the living room's for living, the dining room's for dining. That's where we teach Christ, right in the middle of the home. 
because that's where it'll stick the most, and that's where it'll learn. And we do that because we have this platform of permanency. Uh, this is us. Adults who are available, predictable, and accountable create a very stable platform so that development happens very naturally. But if we're not predictable, like it was in my family growing up, or if I'm not emotionally available for my kids, or, or available, or if I'm not accountable, if I do dumb things and don't apologize, the platform gets all crooked and the development slows down. So it's our responsibility to create this environment that's nice and stable for these unstable kids to develop on. And, and this is true, especially with older kids, and the 20-somethings, who are all of a sudden trying to figure out, how in the world am I going to do this adult life? Uh, and they have so less helpers around them. But we keep this stable platform for them, and we give them this opportunity. But that's a great one to put on your refrigerator. Physical, educational, emotional, and spiritual. And if we do this, uh, we'll find that we are resilient. Now, I'm not going to go into these slides after this, but your, your, your family will be like that trampoline. You could bounce on it, but it doesn't break. Their faith in Christ will be you can bounce on it. They can have tragedies and successes, but it won't break. It'll just be a, a stable force for them to, to try new things on. And, that, and that's the goal. And of course, if we do this, then we have these. Let me finish up with this little, this little object lesson. If we do these, we can have this, these problems that come. And I took some, I took some, uh, I like to play with balloons. I actually threw a water balloon at uh, the youth minister I used to serve with. He was walking into the office. I was on the second floor, and I was like, ah. So I threw it at him, and I got the idea of using this uh, for this. But like this problem right here, you remember what happened with this problem? With the balloon, let me get my last balloon. The, the balloon comes across the problem, and we know what happens when we don't have the Holy Spirit. We're just filled with hot air, right? And we come to a problem, and it does, like it, 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 we blow up. And this is what you see all over the news. Uh, but if we have the Holy Spirit, streams of living water, we can help our kids come to those exact same problems and they'll never blow up. The water dissipates the heat. It's an object lesson. Uh, but it teaches us so much of what our kids... We can raise kids that can handle the problems. They don't need to blow up. They don't need to have all kinds of things they supplement themselves with to feel okay with their realities. They can trust that God is right in the middle of it because they see you trusting that God is right in the middle of you. And we model that for them. And by doing so, we could balance these nails and we could do all this stuff. But, but I'm telling you, we, we can run out of time. Uh, like like this right here, ugh. that's, um, let me get the right number here in case there's an engineer in a room like me who would actually do the math, because uh, I will do the math. Okay, so this is 936 marbles. Uh, one marble for every week of a child's life from when they're born to when they turn 18 years old. So when a child is born, you've got lots of time to work with them on this. You, ha you have all of these marbles. You have 936 weeks to help them become resilient, to develop physically, educationally, emotionally. You have all this time. But of course, we know well, as the sun rises and the sun sets, we, we run out of time a little bit. This is, this is nine years old. And of course, if you're a parent of a nine-year-old, you know that you've lost some of your marbles. Uh, and, uh, and this represents half the time is gone. And you're like, so you can see this pictorial representation. It's like, okay, yeah, i got to get busy. I'm glad we're having this class. I'm glad I came tonight because I want to get busy on this. And, and then you're like, wow, that's really kind of, and then you, this is when they're 16 years old. Whew. It's like, okay, wow, that's, I've, I'm really running out of time. I need to get on this now. And you might say, well, my kids aren't that young anymore. Right, so this could be when they're 18 years old till they're 36 years old. Uh, and, and this could be half of that time. So maybe when they turn 18 and you're with them a lot less, you're like, ooh, these marbles are a little bit more precious because I'm not living with them as much as I used to. 
And, and, then, and then time goes by quickly. And you're like, wow, they're, they were 18. Now they're 27 years old. Oh, my goodness. They've created this whole life that I don't think I'm really a, as much of a part of as I used to be. And my voice is getting smaller and smaller. And, and then you find yourself really starting to run out of time. They're 34, 35 years old. And you're, you're watching them raise their kids. And you're like, ugh, that reminds me of, uh, that, that, why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? And, and, and so we have, to, we have to keep in mind that time is of the essence. Careers are important. I chased the almighty dollar in my 20s. Uh, social activities are important, recreational, hunting and all the other stuff is important, but nothing is as important as the opportunity to come alongside a child in their development as part of your own family development. So don't don't major in the minors. Uh, keep the main thing, the main thing. And that means you're going to probably have to say no to a lot of things to say, ne- to say yes to the main thing. Uh, I used to travel for a living, 100,000 air miles a year all over the world. It was fantastic in my 20s. Uh, we had four kids along the way, and, and uh, the, mess, the mess was getting bigger. And I had to make a decision to get off the road uh, because I was... I was uh, doing none of this. <laughs> At 30 years old or 31 years old, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I was doing none of it. And I had to, I said no to that job and all the prestige that went with it and all the ego inflation that went with it. And I got off the road and, and, and I had to keep the main thing, the main thing. So my, that's my challenge. Keep the main thing. Say no to what needs to be said no so you can say yes to the main thing. And God will bless you in that. He blessed us beyond what we ever could have imagined. Uh, with our decisions to say no to those things and say yes to the main thing. And we're grateful for that. And we did it in just the right time, too. So thank you for your time tonight, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. Let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father, Lord, as we gather together in this, this, this little corner of the world, in your creation with these people's lives that you know so much about, Father, you know so much about who they are, uh, we just pray, Father, that you'll, you'll continue to take this, this little offering of our time, this little, this little offering of our time as, as our way of saying, yes, Lord, we want to we wanna be part of the solution. We want to be part of, of, of seeing our kids reach their full potential in Christ. Lord, help us in this. We need help. Ooh, we need help, Father. So send the helpers alongside of us, Father, the, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete inside of us. Father, we pray for your power. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus to Christ. Amen. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer questions or whatever. So I'll be, I'll be here. So thanks for your time.